We have learned about the Gauss elimination technique until date most finite element codes, commercial finite element codes use the Gauss elimination method as the basis for the solver that they use. Uh, however, um, most codes will also take into account the fact that um, the matrix that you are so trying to solve, the matrix equation that you are trying to solve involves a symmetric uh, stiffness matrix. It's uh, sparse, meaning most of the places are zero and has a banded nature uh, very often. Uh, so uh, it will take all these uh, into account and build it into the uh, Gauss elimination process by various techniques uh, in order to reduce the uh, number of operations that are needed. Remember, uh, Gauss elimination requires n cube number of operations uh, where n is the size of the stiffness matrix. Uh, in spite of all these uh, sophistications, uh, for problems with large number of degrees of freedom, the storage required for the k-matrix may be significant. And uh, with the advent of very powerful computers, especially with the advent of um, accessible parallel computing, uh, iterative methods are becoming uh, popular again. And one of the most popular and most powerful iterative methods is the conjugate gradient technique. So uh, we will learn about the conjugate gradient technique. There's a variation of the conjugate gradient technique called the preconditioned conjugate gradient technique. Uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, the preconditioned conjugate gradient technique, which we call PCG, and the conjugate gradient technique, which we call CG. Now, uh, what the CG method aims to do is uh, it tries to minimize this uh, quantity, which is a scalar, it, as you can see. So the left hand side is a scalar. This is u transpose k u. So this is n cross n. This is n cross 1. And this is 1 cross n. So the result is 1 cross 1. Again, f is n cross 1. So this is 1 cross n. This is n cross 1. This is 1 cross 1 as well. So this is a scalar. And if you look at it carefully, we have encountered this before in connection with the trusses and we will encounter it many times uh, later as well. Uh, this is actually the potential energy of the system in as a function of the uh, degrees of freedom at the nodes. So uh, this, when you minimize it with respect to u, uh, it is easy to show and we will show it formally later that when you minimize this, uh, when you take its derivative with respect to u, what you get is this u transpose u is like u square. This is just a u. And if you uh, if you take its derivative with respect to u, uh, you get ku minus f. And the derivative with respect to u we call as pi prime. So we put a prime to indicate that you have taken a derivative with respect to u. Now, uh, a critical point of this function uh, critical point of this function will be when pi prime is equal to zero, which is same as ku equal to f, which was our starting uh, starting equilibrium equation that we had derived so many times. Now, uh, what that means is that minimizing this quantity, minimizing this quantity is equivalent to solving ku equal to f minimizing is equal is equivalent to solving ku equal to f. How do we know that this critical point is indeed a minimum? Uh, we know that because k is a symmetric and positive definite, ma definite matrix by definition, by uh, design of uh, the elasticity problem. And uh, when that is the case, this critical point is always turns out to be uh, minimum because when you take another derivative of this and you get pi double prime which is called the hessian uh, you get k uh, and k being symmetric and positive definite is kind of you can think of it as being greater than zero and that ensures that this critical point is a minimum so uh, for a symmetric and positive definite k uh, the minimum is guaranteed so 
uh, what we have uh, we have learned from here is minimizing this uh, statement is same as finding a solution to this so what conjugate gradient method tries to do is try to find a minimum of this quantity when uh, k is symmetric and positive definite so uh, most of the time uh, the k that we that we try to invert or the k u equal to f that we try to solve is actually k prime u equal to f prime where k prime has been modified for, by the for the specified boundary conditions f prime has been modified for the specified boundary conditions but uh, we will drop the primes from now on and uh, the understanding will be that when you write k u equal to f uh, you actually mean k prime u equal to f prime okay so to avoid confusion with uh, this derivative that we have taken we will drop the primes primes here on will only mean derivatives now the conjugate gradient method takes off from an older method called the method of steepest descent uh, which says the following uh, before before going into that let us look at what this is this is the gradient of u and this gradient of u is actually a vector which you can think of like this del pi del u1 with respect to the first degree of freedom with respect to the second one and so on up to the nth so this is the gradient and each of these contain information on how pi changes if you change ui keeping all other degrees of freedom fixed so that is the gradient of this function that defines the gradient of this function and uh, the method of steepest descent tells me that if uh, i have if i slide down the direction of the negative direction of the gradient so uh, let's suppose i have a function 2d function so uh, let's suppose i have a function of x and y so this is my x uh, and uh, this is my y and I have a function which let's say is so this the height above this xy plane is my function so this is my function it is a surface so if I have this function I make an initial guess so here I am talking about a function of two variables x and y this is a function of n variables so I make a guess uh, which is some x y value some x naught y naught and I am let's say here so this is my first guess and where I want to reach finally is here the minima of this function this is my pi for x and y as a function of x and y and it is here that I want to reach let's say this is my um, solution actual solution to the problem and I have started with this x naught so the idea of the steepest descent method is that if I start from here the best chance of reaching this point that I have is if I slide down the direction of the steepest gradient uh, from this point so if I slide down the, the gradient is in this direction and the gradient is your pi prime and if I slide down along pi prime minus pi prime so this is pi prime at u naught and if I slide down in the direction opposite of pi prime I have the I have the best chance of reaching here so I make a guess u naught or x naught in this case and then I calculate something called a residual so this residual at the initial stage is R naught and the residual is F minus K U naught and it tells me how far off from the actual solution that I I am so if U naught was the actual solution then this would of course be zero but uh, the deviation from zero the the distance from zero 
will give me the residual which will kind of tell me how far how how bad my initial guess is and also note that uh, pi prime at any point is ku minus f so pi prime u naught or minus pi prime u naught is f minus ku so the residual is actually the negative of the gradient so i have to go down i have to go down in the direction of the negative of the gradient or in the direction of r naught that is where i have to go down how much do i have to go down let's say i go down by a fraction alpha r naught i have decided that r naught is the steepest direction and then i will try to go down by alpha r naught uh, and my next u1 which is uh, x1 in my case here so my new point x1 is alpha or not from my old x naught and in this case u1 is u naught plus alpha naught r naught now uh, how will i determine alpha naught uh, to determine alpha naught i take this following strategy i say okay determine alpha naught in such a way that find alpha naught in such a way that i move along r naught r naught is a fixed direction r naught is the direction of the residual that i have calculated that i can calculate once i have guessed u naught now i will go down by an amount such that the energy at u1 or the energy at this point the value of this function pi at this point will be as low as possible so it it should be as low as possible based on that i will find alpha naught so i'll choose an alpha naught that will make pi u1 as low as possible so del del phi naught of pi u1 should be equal to zero and then if you just put the expression for u1 into this expression so to calculate by u1 you write half u0 plus alpha r not alpha not r not transpose k u0 plus alpha not r not minus f transpose u0 plus alpha not r not and take dd alpha not of this of both sides both sides and set that equal to zero you will get an expression for alpha naught and that expression would be this so this alpha naught gives you the the uh, amount of movement that you need to do along r naught such that you achieve the uh, maximum decrease in the energy from your previous point which was x naught so uh, most of the time uh, we don't draw 3d plots like this we draw contoured plots so the contoured plots are like 2d diagrams so we plot x this way y this way and then uh, plot potential lines corresponding to each of these heights so equi height lines so maybe um, something this your x is here this is this point and then we draw uh, contour lines these are iso height lines for this function and then we have started somewhere here this is my x naught i have moved along r naught i moved alpha r naught and i have reached x1 which is here in the 2d plot so from now on we'll we'll not draw these 3d diagrams we'll draw these 2d diagrams to illustrate the point so uh, I haven't shown the maths, but the maths is pretty straightforward. Once you find this pi u1, you can take derivative with respect to alpha naught, and you can easily prove that this is the amount by which you have to move along r naught to achieve the maximum decrease in the energy. So, once you have done this, uh, there's nothing stopping you from uh, doing it over and over again. Uh, but before that, uh, you have to realize an important aspect of this so uh, we did del del alpha naught uh, pi u1 
which we can write as uh, derivative of pi with respect to components of u1 uh, times d d alpha naught of u1 and remember u1 is u0 plus alpha naught r naught so uh, d d alpha naught of u1 is simply r naught and this is the gradient at u1 and we have already seen that the gradient at u1 is negative of the residual so we can write it as we can write this as minus r1 transpose r0 equal to 0 which means the residue at the at the one -th step and the residue at the 0th step are perpendicular to each other these are the directions in which we are moving remember we are moving from u0 to u1 which is equal to u0 plus alpha naught r naught and then we will move to u2 which will be u1 plus alpha 1 r1 and so on this is how we are going to move and then at each of these stages r0 and r1 are perpendiculars perpendicular to each other that's what we have proved here and that means that if I start from this x0 point, if I start from this x0 point in this 2D example, I move along r0, then I move along r1, which is perpendicular, then I again move along r2, uh, which is perpendicular. I keep on moving along uh, this staircase kind of path until I reach this solution, which is my, which is my desired solution, u. <coughs> so, this is what I do at every step. So at every step, I calculate the residual, which is the difference between the externally applied force and the KU that I get with the uh, with the value of U at that instant, that ith step. So this would be zero for equilibrium, but uh, since UI is not the actual solution, this will have a value and that value is the residual. Then I will calculate the alpha i at that stage and then I will move along, uh, I know ui, so I will add alpha i ri to it and I will get ui plus 1. I will go back, I will go back here, again calculate ri plus 1 with ui plus 1, alpha i with i plus 1 and again I will do alpha i plus 2. and keep on doing it till the norm of ui plus 1 minus ui this norm becomes uh, an acceptable small value so this is the method of steepest descent method of steepest descent where we use n orthogonal surge directions r0 r1 to rn minus 1 uh, to start from a guess and then iteratively converge onto the solution. Uh, the conjugate gradient method is a variation of this where we do not use R0 and R1 and R2 etc. We do not use these quantities, these mutually perpendicular quantities as the search directions but instead we use another set of vectors P0, P1 to p n minus 1 these new set of vectors as the surge directions so that means that instead of this equation what we use is u i plus 1 is equal to u i plus alpha i p i this is what we use where these p's are not orthogonal functions but k orthogonal functions Remember, R's were orthogonal functions so that Ri transpose Rj is equal to 0. R, the R's are perpendicular to each other. In particular, we had proved that R1 transpose R0 is equal to 0. On the other hand, K orthogonal means Pi transpose K Pj is equal to 0. So instead of pi transpose pj equal to 0, what we use is pi transpose k pj equal to 0. So these p's, the p's have these property, these property and as it turns out that 
we can generate these P's from the R's. So we generate the R's, which is the residue at every step. And then from the R's, we generate the P's. And then uh, we use those P's as search directions and then move uh, from the guess point down, uh, down a different path than what you see here, not a set of perpendicular paths. Uh, uh, the problem with steepest descent is that in uh, you will see that many a time we are moving in the same direction. So, uh, so uh, we are moving in this direction here, in same direction here, the same direction here. So we are moving in the same direction a multiple number of times. Uh, the conjugate gradient gradient tries to avoid that and tries to tries to move in a clever direction so that uh, we home in on the actual solution quickly. Uh, I'm not going to explain. Uh, explain a great deal about how this, what this means, and how this, uh, how this matters. But uh, conjugate gradient is just a better version of the steepest descent. However, the first step in the conjugate gradient method is the same as the steepest descent method. So, so what we do is we first guess and u naught, and here we calculate r naught, which is f minus k u naught. This is the residual at the onset and then we calculate alpha naught and then we calculate u1 equal to u0 plus alpha naught r naught and uh, at the first step this is said to be equal to r naught so the in, at, in the first step p naught and r naught are the same but then onwards we generate uh, the p's from the r's and this is how we do it uh, so this is how we do it we are trying to trying to use search directions which are k orthogonal as i said and then um, we generate these p's from we generate these p's from the r's using uh, this value of the scalar beta so we have rk plus 1 we have rk and from those two we can generate the scalar quantity beta and then pk plus 1 is rk plus 1 the residue at this point times beta p beta k pk this is how we generate the new surge direction from an old surge direction and then it uh, it all goes according to this first we calculate uh, qk equal to k pk then this alpha k is the usual formula which is rk transpose rk divided by pk transpose k pk which is the formula for the steepest descent that we have derived this formula this is the value of alpha k we get that as usual then uh, uk plus 1 is so in the in the initial stage uh, in the first stage, as I said, P naught and alpha naught, P naught and R naught are the same. So uh, the first step is U1 equal to U0 plus alpha naught uh, P0, which is same as R0. So it's same as the, then we go on to get R1, which is R1 minus uh, R0 minus alpha 0 k p naught or k r naught which is the same then we calculate beta k beta uh, 1 and then we calculate p1 from here then we go back then we go back all the way here we calculate q2 and the cycle continues and we do this till this norm becomes small enough or the residual becomes close enough to zero so that we know that ku equal to f has been attained so uh, in a nutshell this is how uh, this is these are my functions these are the contour lines iso height lines suppose i started from here this is my x naught that i started from and steepest descent would go along this then turn 90 degrees turn 90 degrees turn 90 degrees and finally home in on the solution whereas conjugate gradient in this case would just converge in two steps so it will take the first step which is the same as the 
as the steepest descent but then instead of taking the zigzag uh, zigzag 90 degree path uh, it will home in on the solution along this part and that's because we are now using a search direction that is not a set of set of these perpendicular vectors but these k orthogonal vectors p which we generate which we can generate from the uh, from this orthogonal basis so this orthogonal basis is used to generate a new basis which is a set of p orthogonal uh, k orthogonal vectors and that is used to reduce the number of steps now the in interesting thing here from the finite element perspective is that in this case all you need all all the uh, the need for k is in this step this is where you calculate k times pk now uh, k times pk is a vector so uh, this vector can actually be assembled element by element you can assemble it just like you assemble a force vector this can be assembled element by element which means that we in this if we adopt this solver we may never want to actually assemble the stiffness matrix in the way we have learned in the previous week so we never we, we may get away by never assembling the stiffness matrix and that actually saves a lot of trouble and that actually makes this uh, technique ideal for implementation in a parallel finite element algorithm and that's that's the beauty that's the power of this method that when you have very large problems and you are doing it on a parallel machine this might actually work out much faster and much more efficient to code than uh, a gauss elimination technique so uh, that's all for this week next week we will look at um, other kinds of elements, some other kinds of elements other than the truss element that we have.